Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm so happy because so many people are here today at, at the Bible study. And we're glad that you're here on Facebook or YouTube also. And we pray that all of you will be really blessed by this um, study that we're doing today on Romans chapter 4 and chapter 5. So we have chapter 4 and chapter 5 today. And um, we're going to be talking about the three imputations. There are, and so that's going to be really interesting. And we're taking a closer look at the book of Romans and all of Paul's letters to get closer with God. Because the way to get closer with God is to study his word more and more because every time we do, we get something more out of it. And so that's how we're going to be near my God to be. And we need to be dispensational. It's not enough to be just biblical. We also need to be dispensational or we're not going to understand the Bible. And do you have a retirement plan? I'm not talking about your 401k. I'm talking about your eternal retirement plan for your eternal position in heaven. Because your understanding of the Bible is dependent on the position you will have in heaven. Are you in Adam? Or are you in Christ? Mm -hmm. That's going to be important to today's lesson as we study, especially chapter 5. And do you understand the mystery that we find in the Bible? And in chapter 5, we will notice that Paul, who has been speaking about sins, the wrong things we do, will begin to speak about sin, which is our sin nature. And it's very important to know that we cannot go to heaven unless we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. The verse in the Bible that helps us to understand the Bible is 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So let's um, take a minute to pray to our Lord Jesus Christ that he would bless this study of his word. Thank you, Holy Father God, that you sent your Son to take our place on the cross and to pay for our sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scriptures. We pray that many people who watch this Bible study will not only be saved but also to come to the knowledge of truth. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so I have a treat for you all today. Oh. We're going to have a little tiny felt story but first before we do that let's talk about salvation and how to be saved and so in our in our closer look we're going to um you know sometimes we we um even take a closer look of ourselves in a mirror mm -hmm. and when we look in the mirror and we look at the windows of the soul which are the eyes. Sometimes all we see is little blood vessels. We don't see Jesus Christ in there, but we know he's in there because the Bible tells us so. So we walk by faith in what God tells us in his word. So let's go over and talk about salvation. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, this this was um, represents me, and how um, I was in Adam, and um, then I heard about the Ten Commandments, and I couldn't keep them. 
Mm -hmm. I broke the Ten Commandments. I had not been perfect. So I had done some wrong things in my life. So I was disqualified from, for going to heaven. Because if we've done just one thing wrong in our life, we can't go to heaven without being obliterated because God cannot tolerate any sin before Him. So I, one day, when I was actually 37 years old, which was, uh, I'm dating myself. <laughs> this was in 1990. I trusted in that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and that he was my substitute. He took my place on the cross. And I, when was I saved? When, what was the exact moment that I was saved? When you believed. It was the exact moment that I decided in my heart that I was going to believe what God had said about His Son. That He took my place on the cross, died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. And when I believed that, it was the most important day in my life. Light came into my dark soul. And I was on my knees that evening telling God after about four or five weeks of studying with some women that were trying to save my soul, I told God that I believed what he said in the Bible about his son and what his son had done. And I didn't know hardly anything else about the Bible. I just knew that. And later on, I had another important day. And that important day was when I became knowledgeable about the distinct ministry of Apostle Paul. Because the Bible, well, Paul himself said that if any man considers himself spiritual, then he must um, agree that the things that I speak to you are the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was when I became spiritual. When I understood the distinct um, ministry of Apostle Paul. So that was another important day in my life. But what happened was, I was transferred out of Adam into Christ. Okay? And so, when that happened, I received the imputed the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when the Holy Father God now looked at me, he saw the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find out that the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ is much more than what I had lost when I was in Adam. Okay? So let's go over that, because this is in the, at the end of chapter 5 today. So this is about Adam and the law. By one man's offense, death passed upon all men. And this is Christ and grace. Christ's free gift, his righteousness, by grace abounded to many, all those that believe. By one man's sin came to condemnation. The free gift of justification was given for of their offenses that we had done. By one man's offense, death reigned. Because that one man was Adam. The gift of righteousness of grace was by one man. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. By the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification. Moreover, the law entered, remember, the law entered, that sin may abound to make sin more obvious. The law made sin more obvious. Because of Christ, where sin abounded, 
Grace did much more abound. As sin hath reigned unto death, so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So grace reigned much more. Remember? Much more. So when I believed and I received the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was not just as if I had never sinned. I received the righteousness of the Son of God, Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah the Creator. I received His righteousness. Adam means man. Who is stronger, man or the Son of God? The Son of God. <laughs> the Son the of God. God. And I had the Son of God's righteousness on me, and it will never be taken away. And now I can stand before the Holy Father. Because sitting at the right hand of the Father right now, this very second, is the solution to the sin problem. So you can scan up here if you want to, girls. Because sitting at the right hand of the Father is the solution to the sin problem. Alright, then come on back here because we got more. Okay, so it's very important to understand that Jesus Christ is this priest king for the na uh, nation of Israel that is going to be a, na a kingdom of priests. So today there are no legitimate priests. Because right today we are ambassadors. Believers are ambassadors. Okay, so um, the problem was how can a sinner stand before the Holy God? And the solution was the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we saw that righteousness was needed in the first three chapters of Romans. And now we're going to talk about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Remember on our very first lesson, we went over the um, Romans chapter review sentences. So let's catch ourselves up. So in Romans chapter 1, the power of the gospel of Christ, his righteousness, Gentiles under sin. That's what Romans chapter 1 was about. Mm -hmm. Then chapter 2, the Jews who had the law are under sin. Then in chapter 3, the whole world is guilty before God. But God has solved the sin problem and saved believers in time past and in the present dispensation of grace. In chapter 4, which we're covering today, we receive Christ's imputed righteousness when we believe what he did. And in chapter 5, the result of justification, peace and access to God, we have much more in Christ than we lost in Adam. His righteousness totally rids us of sin and gives us complete justification. Now, the 13 letters that Paul wrote, and they all begin with the name Paul, um, follow the order in the Bible that was established by this verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that's um, 2 Timothy 3.16. So, Romans will be in first because it's the doctrine, the basic doctrine that we need. Although Galatians and um, Thessalonians were written before. Um, and so were the Corinthian letters. So, first and second Corinthians will be reproof. And Galatians, correction. Ephesians is advanced doctrine. Philippians, reproof. Colossians, correction. First and second Thessalonians is doctrine again about the rapture and the second coming of Christ. And 
Then we have First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, which is doctrine and instruction in righteousness. So the Acts epistles were written before Paul had the full revelation of the mystery. Okay. We're not going to go over our edification process. We did that in um, part two when we did um, chapters one through three. So you can go back and find that if you haven't seen that video. So uh, the Bible is laid out prophecy, mystery, prophecy. And prophecy goes from Genesis to Acts 9, then mystery, Romans to Philemon, and then prophecy again, Hebrews through Revelation. So the kingdom of God is made up of two realms, heaven and earth. Before Paul was saved, no one in the Bible thought about living in the, for eternity in heaven. Okay, and my website is miriammanley.com. And my, um, the YouTube channel that carries my videos is called Truth Be Told. Um, on my website, we have several free PDFs for anyone who's interested. So let's go ahead now and look at our chapter. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Before I get too, too carried away, I wanted to say that the theme of Romans is the righteousness of God. Mm. And the... Um, the key verse is actually two key verses. Let's go over the key verses. Follow me over here. I'll grab these. So I'm, I'm going to show these. And we can show them now. Oh, there. All right. So um, it's Romans 1, 16 and 17 are the key verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, the Greek being to Gentiles. So, um, I, we don't know how this operation of God happens, where he takes the sinner and translates him out of Adam into Christ. And it's almost like a miracle. You know, we don't understand that operation of God. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So God revealed how righteous he was and how righteous he is, that he can't tolerate any sin of any kind. And so we needed the perfect imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he had the faith, and he was faithful to keep the law perfectly and to accomplish the Father's plan. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So after we're justified, we live by faith in the Word of God to us. Okay. So Romans chapter 4 and 5. Um, imputation explained using Abraham. That's chapter 4. Um, chap um, and when we read chapter 4, we might ask, what is this blessedness in verse 9? What is this blessedness? And then in chapter 5, it talks about the result of justification. And what does this... If someone has their phone on, could you please turn it off? Okay, what does the similitude of Adam's transgression mean? Okay, uh, is that is it my phone? It, no, no, I don't have our phone. Have phone? Uh, is it your phone? phone? Yeah, but my phone's connected up here. I, 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 I okay. I don't know. I, don't I mean, uh, it's very faint. Okay, it's very faint. Okay, there. Okay, um, okay. So. What, is the, what does it mean when the Bible says the similitude of Adam's transgression? We're going to go over that. And um, 
also, what is the wrath that we're saved from in chapter 5? What is that wrath in verse 9 that we're saved from? And also, what is the free gift that believers receive in 517? So, um, in chapter 3 that we covered last week, we found out that even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, so he had the faith, unto all and upon all them that believe. So, we receive... His righteousness when we believe. It's unto all and upon all that believe. For there is no difference. There's no difference between anybody who ever believes receives the righteousness. No matter how bad. Mm. Simple. Yes, we're trying to make this very simple for everyone. That's, that's what we do. So we go on in Romans 3, which is our gospel. This is a gospel has the power to translate us out of Adam into Christ. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So everyone has sinned. There's no one on the planet that hasn't sinned. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He's the redeemer and he accomplished the redemption you know, with his own blood. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Okay, and we talked about what propitiation was last week. And it's a fully satisfying sacrifice. And that was Jesus Christ, our Lord. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. So the Lord Jesus Christ paid for all the sins in the past um, um, George if your phone is on could you please turn it off okay so he paid for Ad, um, Adams and Abrahams and all those people that had believed God and were in Abraham's bosom he paid for all their sins uh, Paul uh, explains through the forbearance of God God knew that he was going to do that to declare, I say, at this time, during the dispensation of grace, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 3, 22, if we take the other one, and through 26. So, um, his righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, is imputed to the sinner, so that the Father can be just, and declare whoever has believed to be justified. Okay. Just before we do our felts, let's go over the books. So if you follow me over here, um, Nancy. Where are you going? I'm going right over here to talk about the books. Okay, because we have some new books. Okay. So we have God's secret, a primer with pictures for how to rightly divide the word of truth. Mm -hmm. That's an overview of the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, George helped me to translate it. Huh? And he's here today. So anyway, um, he, um, so this also comes in black and white or in color. And he helped me with El Secreto de Dios. And right oh, sure. now, someone in Kathmandu, Nepal, has translated it into Nepali, and he also speaks Hindi. How many people here would like for the people of India to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Yeah. Raise your hand if you care about the people of India. Okay, mm -hmm. so he is just, um, he's finished in Nepali, and I helped him with the finances for um, printing the Nepali um, <coughs> mini Bible because God's Secret is like a mini Bible mm -hmm. and um, he's going to be distributing it and he had already translated Paul's letters 
um, in the King James Bible to Nepali language. So he's also going to provide that for the pe his people. And so if anybody wants to help his ministry, now he's working on the book for India. And he will also include in that one the article at the back of God's Secret on the King James Bible. So if anyone wants to help him, you can, whatever money comes in to PayPal on my website, MarianneManley.com, between now and the end of the year, I'm going to contribute to the people in India for, you know, contribute to him so that the people of India can be saved and come to right provision. So if you want to contribute, if you want to be part of this big thing that God is doing for so many people that live there, then please contribute there. Um, we're also going to be taking up a little collection here, and we have sent him a little, a little more money for the India um, uh, God Secret in Hindi. And um, I'm really excited about his work. He's, he's a right divider. And he's a King James Bible believer. So um, then we have um, Romans, a concise commentary, which have all the verses in it um, that are in Romans. We have it also in black and white. The other one was color. And we have 1 Corinthians, a commentary. 2 Corinthians, a commentary. Galatians, a commentary. And I'm so grateful that so many of you are buying all our books. We've been booming with book sales, and many people have said, even pastors, that they have all our books, and that just warms my heart. So, Ephesians, a commentary. Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, a commentary. And this is our new book, Rightly Dividing Romans, um, a study guide. And I was helped by our very own Madeline... Wilkinson, who from South Africa, with the cover. And um, if you look at it, you can see that the gospel is on the cover. We have the cross and, you know, the resurrection. And um, I love her work with the cover. It's so professional. Um, we've also come out with How to Be Saved, made simple, a little booklet, um, and it's just perfect for giving to our lost family members. So I'm getting bunches and giving them out. Um, we also have Why Was the Earth Without Form, Void, and Dark, which is a book about how God says he made heaven and earth. We have a children's book called Just As God Said, with lots and lots of colored pictures. And um, it's an overview of the Bible in 50 pages. Paul's pastoral epistles goes over 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Then we have 1st um, and 2nd Thessalonians in a book called The Certainty of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. If someone is not Pauline in their doctrine, they're not going to understand the rapture. And this book is amazing. It comes with amazing color pictures. Um, and we also have it in black and white with the same pictures. We have now um, missed the rapture. Read this commentary on Hebrews. This is something that will help anyone to understand the, um, the prophetic scriptures. Hebrews through Revelation and also um, uh, the four Gospels and um, the Old Testament. And that is a good one to leave for our friends who missed the rapture to help them get through the tribulation and into the kingdom. We have a three-part series on um, um, Acts of the Apostles. And finally, we have a three-volume set on Paul's letters with all of the verses of the um, Bible, Paul's letters in them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm handing them off to you, Patty. Okay. And Patty Carlson has made all the signs that we're using um, which help us to picture in our mind what we're talking about. You know, give it our minds uh, something to think about. Mm -hmm. And remember, we're going to go over the three, the three imputations. 
we'll do that right after we go over this little felt story. Because in Romans chapter 4, um, Abraham, well, let me get this Abraham. Okay. This is Abraham when he's over 100. <laughs> <laughs> and um, his body is as good as dead, functionally, as far as reproduction is concerned. And uh, we know that um, Sarah was barren. And so, um, after um, Abraham had met Melchizedek, the king priest from Salem, he had a vision. And in that vision, he asked God, is this Eliezer, my servant, going to be my heir? Because you haven't given me any children. So God took him out and he said, you know, look at the stars. And that's how many your children are going to be. There are going to be as many, if you can tell the stars, which means, you know, count, you know, then that's how many children you're going to have. And so that's a phenomenal number. And Abraham believed what God said, that God was going to give him descendants from him, his own self. So, um, yeah. Then in um, Romans chapter 4, we also have David. And so um, da King David had sinned, and he had um, done something wrong, and in order to explain to him and help him to see his error, the prophet Nathan came to him, and he told him a story about a man who had many sheep, and then he told him a story about another man who had just one little ewe lamb that he loved, and he gave him or that little lamb, uh, something to drink from his own cup, and had the little ewe lamb in his, in his uh, lap. And, you know, that little ewe lamb was like a family member. So instead of taking one of his own flock to feed a traveler that came to his home, he s slayed that little ewe lamb and serve the little you lamb up for the traveler that came to visit him. So King David got really upset. And he said that whoever that is, he must die. And then Nathan said, you are that man. And then King David said, I have, you know, well, first Nathan said, when you um, took Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, you sinned. And then when you put Uriah the Hittite on the front lines where he was going to be killed in war, you know, you, you took his life. And so David then said, I have sinned against God. And um, Nathan said, don't worry, God has put away your sin, you're not going to die. And so at that point, King David wrote uh, Psalm 32, which is quoted by Paul in our story in Romans chapter 4. Okay, so let's talk about um, the three imputations. Okay. First of all, yeah, so um, Adam's sins were imputed to, to man, to mankind, okay? That's how, after Adam's sin, death entered. And there was death um, from Adam on, although... Once the law came in with Moses, that de the law made the sin even worse. And then um, 
that sin was imputed to the people from the law. So Adam's sin was, you know, spread to all men. That's the first imputation. You know, his sin was imputed to all of us, all of mankind. And then man's sin was imputed to Jesus Christ. When Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. So that's in 2 Corinthians 5.19. And whoever believes, then those believers receive Christ's righteousness imputed to them. And so that's how the three imputations work. And I, I hope that was an easy explanation. Mm -hmm. So, um, God's purpose, we talked about election last week, and I hope I wasn't confusing. I was trying to say that God can elect to use someone that's a good person, that's a believer, or he, sometimes he even elects to use someone to serve him that's not a believer. So, God's purpose in election is... Um, to have two groups of saved people. One to live in heaven for all eternity, and another group to live on earth for all eternity. So let's go ahead and get going with our lesson. If you'll please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, and we're going to just hit the highlights again. Um, so... I hope that you can uh, li put on your listening ears. So Paul spends the entire chapter 4 to illustrate God's solution to man's sin problem, his son's imputed righteousness. Imputation was something that God had done in the past. The Father was able to justify others in time past because he had complete confidence that his son would pay the sin debt. His son did not disappoint him with incomprehensible love, self-sacrifice, and courage. He paid the ransom. Abraham and David were justified or received God's imputed righteousness by faith alone and not by something they did. It is the person that simply believes God and does not think that they can earn their salvation by their own works or righteousness by keeping the law, but trusts in Christ's work on the cross and resurrection who is saved. Romans 4, 5. <clears throat> Abraham believed that God would give him many descendants and make a nation out of him just as God had said. Because Abraham believed God, he received God's imputed righteousness. He did not work for it. Romans 4, 3 and Genesis 15, 6. When I told the story, I was quoting some verses from, Gen or telling, you know, paraphrasing some verses from Genesis 15, 5 and 6. When Abraham believed his faith was counted for righteousness, thus this blessedness, which is imputed righteousness, come only on the circumcision believing Jews or on the uncircumcision Gentiles also. I forgot to mention that it was after Abraham believed God about the stars that he was later circumcised. So, he believed while he was uncircumcised. Mm. Since Abraham believed while uncircumcised, he is the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. 4.11 God gave Abraham the token or seal of circumcision after he believed while uncircumcised. Therefore, Abraham is the father of those who have faith, whether they are circumcised or not, and have God's in righteousness imparted to them because of their faith. He is the father of those who have faith as he did. Abraham believed and became the heir of the world, not through the law, 
but by the righteousness of faith. 4.13 The law points out sins. Righteousness does not come from keeping the law. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. 4.14 If law keepers receive righteousness, then it is not received by faith, and the promise of righteousness by faith is made of none effect. If we think we must add any of our own works to what Christ has done, we make our faith null and void. If we say we added to our salvation by being water baptized, walking an aisle, confessing our sins, eating a wafer, doing good deeds, and so on, we insult the Father and imply that what his son did was not enough. Anyone who adds their own work to Christ's finished work on Calvary is not saved. Therefore, it, imputed righteousness, is a faith by grace. God is gracious to impute his son's righteousness to the believer and give them eternal life. The promise was to all believers, not just those in the previous dispensation. All thy seed, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. 4.17 So, when, when God um, gave righteousness to, imputed righteousness to Abraham, he did so knowing that his son would make the payment. People are spiritually dead before they believe and receive Christ's life. God called Abraham the father of many nations in Genesis 17.5 because he calls those things that have not happened yet as though they had for 17. God imputed his righteousness to Abraham knowing he would later receive his son's perfect righteousness. David's sins could only be forgiven if he had God's imputed righteousness. God did not impute iniquity to David because God had already imputed righteousness to him. Which is called, you know, his spirit. He had his spirit. And um, this is called the sure mercies of David. In um, 2 Samuel 12, 9, and 13, and Psalm 32, 1, and 2. Uh, we hear more about this. So David is blessed and will have eternal life in the kingdom on earth. He'll be resurrected and live in the kingdom on earth. We are not going to be living in the kingdom of, on earth. We're going to live in heaven for all eternity, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Abraham did not look at his or Baron Sarah's old, functionally dead bodies, but believed what God said. Abraham was strong in faith and fully persuaded, 420, that God was able to give him the promised descendants. Therefore, because of Abraham's faith, God imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us the body of Christ in this dispensation. Also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Romans 4, 22 through 25. We are saved and justified when we believe that Jesus our Lord was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. Imputation was in God's word all along. Genesis 15, 6, Psalm 32, 1 and 2. But until Paul was saved, God did not bring to the forefront his solution to man's sin problem. Even now, Satan tries to hide it, as mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Now, that finishes chapter 4.
Now we're going to go on to chapter 5 of Romans. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 5, 1, and 2. The result of justification by faith is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice knowing that our sins are totally taken care of at Calvary. Since we have Christ's imputed righteousness, we can come and stand before the Holy Father without being obliterated. We have access to the Father and our standing by grace is perfect because of Christ's imputed righteousness by faith. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God in heaven, 2 Corinthians 5.1. We can relax because we have been set free from having to be punished from our sins. We glory in this present life which is preparing us for heaven. Our trials help us to grow spiritually. We glory in our infirmities, 2 Corinthians 12.9 or difficulties because tribulations make us patient as we experience the doctrine working in us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 12, 9, and 6, 17. We are not ashamed of the whole because the love of God is shed abroad by, no, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given us by five. Having the Holy Ghost we have his love for God. Paul began the letter by saluting us from the Father and Son who are in heaven and the Holy Ghost is in us. Paul has mentioned all three persons of the Godhead. We had no power to save ourselves. Some would perhaps dare to die for a good man, but God loved us and Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. But God commended his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 5.8 Being now justified by his blood and having received his righteousness, believers will not incur God's wrath, hell, or the tribulation against unbelievers. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and 5.9 if God wanted to save and reconcile us to the Father when we were his enemies, how much more shall we be saved by having his life in us? 5.10 His life in us even saves us in our present life. We have joy because we have been reconciled to the Father by his Son and have his atonement, friendship, now, in this dispensation and his eternal life from the moment we are saved. 5.11 If we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, what else do we need? <laughs> what else do we need? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so now we're going to finish off the rest of chapter 5, starting in verse 12 and going to 21. Our justification in Christ is compared and contrasted with the condemnation we had in Adam. Having talked about our sins, the wrong things we do, in this last section Paul speaks of sin, our sin nature. Sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and passed to all men. 5.12 However, the fact that God did not destroy Adam and Eve immediately meant that God had a plan. The similitude of Adam's transgression. Adam transgressed a clear rule or commandment of God. Remember, don't eat from that tree. You know, don't eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a clear rule. Mm -hmm. And what did he do? He listened to He ate. ate. He ate. <laughs> he ate. He ate. He ate. That's what he did. So, you know, he can't blame anybody because nobody held up to his mouth. He took his own butt. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, we love to blame others, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, not my fault. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> okay, so Adam transgressed a clear rule or a commandment of God. Men died in their sins even before the law was given to Moses. Adam is a figure of Christ. Adam is the federal head of lost mankind, while Christ is the federal head of saved mankind. Being in Adam is compared and contrasted with being in Christ to justification. And we did that at the beginning of the video. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign by one, Jesus Christ. So the gift here is the gift of righteousness. The free gift believers receive is the gift of righteousness. We can reign in this life and the life to come because of the gift of the Son's righteousness. Adam's sins condemned. Adam's sin condemned. I'm sorry. No S on the end. Adam's sin condemned. Christ's free gift is available to all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's, Adam's, disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one Christ many were made righteous 519 moreover the law entered that sin may abound but where sin abounded grace did much more abound one man brought sin another righteousness sin reigned unto death but grace reigned through his righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is not just as if I never sinned. No, having the gift of the Son's imputed righteousness is much greater. It is a abounding eternal perfection. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father God, for your incredible word to us, and how rich it is and how clear it is, how you have just told us plainly that we need your son's imputed righteousness, the son of God's imputed righteousness, or we're not going to have it. So I pray, Lord, that many people will decide in their heart to believe that your son did come to earth and did die on the cross on their behalf and that he did um, rise from the dead and resurrect. Because if they do believe that, Lord, they will also resurrect. And they shouldn't stop, Lord, until they believe. And they shouldn't stop until they understand the mystery. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bye, everybody. Okay, now... <laughs>